Iman, what's up? You were missing from uh, a couple of episodes ago. Yeah, man, I had uh, I had the old COVID. Um, just uh, recovered now, feeling good. But you, you did an okay job without me, so it's all right. I'll, I've survived somehow. Uh, so today, as as of course, as every guest, we aim to have someone who either builds tech or invests in tech in one way or another in a in a, in a logical and rational manner. And I found someone who I was keen to get on for a little while, uh, has experience building and investing, uh, sort of been all over the world. And absolute pleasure to have Bart McDonald. Welcome to the show, mate. Thanks so much, Cyrus and Iman. Great to be here. And uh, Iman, I hope you're feeling better now, man. It sounds... Uh... All good. I'm all good. I, I had the baby version of it. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> Good. Glad to hear. Good, good stuff. So, Bart, your background, um, I won't spend too long on it just because every pod people spend like 10 minutes on their backgrounds, but we do have to touch on your background because it is worthy of touching on. So you went from Notesy to Zero Mail to launching General Assembly in Australia to then Sapling, raising VC funding, and then you have now launched Bloom VP. So... You've pretty much done it all. Uh, tell us like what led to this, uh, what led to Bloom and why, and just walk us like through your journey high level. Yeah, awesome. Uh, definitely doesn't feel like I've done it all. Still got a, a lot lot left to, uh, to learn and, and to, to uh, I guess, to achieve. But um, yeah, look, I guess a simple story for me. Uh, born in Sydney, Australia, so hopefully a slightly better accent than uh, what your list is. Uh, usually used to listening to the, the two of you, but, uh, we, yeah, look, I've, I've been, I've been really fortunate. I've spent a lot of time, uh, traveling all around the world. Um, you know, being, uh, able to, to work in many amazing countries and, and live abroad, but, um, you know, pro- professionally, um, you know, started my career on the, very much on the operating side, uh, came right out of college, initially interested in, in management consulting. Those dreams were, were quickly dashed in the midst of the, the GFC, none of the, the big firms were, were hiring. And so started out cutting my teeth in, in, uh, HR consulting of all, of all things and, uh, being part of a, a large organization very quickly realized that, you know, just moving too slow for me and, and being part of a, uh, a larger piece of machinery. I, I just didn't have that level of, of agency and, and control and, uh, quickly got frustrated with that, spun out, started building a couple of companies, um, and, and really had this thesis that, you know, every spreadsheet within an organization is effectively a, a SaaS application that can be built over time. And so started disrupting that. Fell in love with the idea of uh, ed tech as kind of that was like really my on ramp into build, building digital properties, and um, had a, some you know kind of first second base successes there building a few companies. Got picked up by a, an amazing organization called General Assembly, kind of employee twenty eight there, helping them to, to launch some of their campuses across Australasia, and uh, had the amazing experience as a mid twenty year old, uh, you know, running a, a pretty hefty profit and loss center and, uh, you know, really hiring and, and unfortunately I did a firing of, you know, team members that were, you know, literally double my age. And so cut my teeth there and, uh, you know, just, uh, learned, learned a lot very, very quickly. And one of the things that, that I experienced was, you know, general assembly being an, an amazing you know, rocket ship they'd raised, um, I think a bit over $150 million at that point. And we're really based in, in, uh, uh, or, or heavily focused in the United States. I very felt very much felt like a lot of I was missing out on a lot of the action uh, up there in, in Silicon Valley, and so um, you know made it a, a goal of mine to get up to, to San Francisco, uh, which I did in early 2016. I was able to uh, you know, stay on the couch of a, of a close friend's uh, house for for a couple of months, and then uh, convinced him to leave his very comfortable job where he was chief of staff to an amazing fintech company, which has since IPO'd, and uh, he, he came in and helped me start Sapling, which is also in the another SaaS platform. In, uh, in the mid market HR tech space. So that company, we, we raised about $10 million. Uh, Google's AI fund, Gradient Ventures with our largest investor. We scaled up to a couple hundred uh, customers all around the world, um, serving amazing clients like uh, Webflow and Envision, Figma, Warby Parker. Webflow obviously just raising, uh, announcing their $140 million Series B today at a couple of billion dollar valuation, which is, you know, we kind of got a front row seat to, to helping a lot of those teams scale by using uh, our platform. And, uh, yeah, the back end of last year, uh, Sapling was just a, a acquired as well. So it was a, a great outcome for a lot of our investors and, uh, and team. And we're, uh, yeah, really excited to announce that, that merger with, um, Calidus, which is another great HR platform actually based out there in, uh, and headquartered in, in, in the UK. But, um, for me, I, I kind of realized having been on the operator side of the table, um, for quite some time and doing that repeatedly, I was kind of looking at what, what was next for me and 
also wanting to stay stay based in in, in the US and uh, you know kind of rec- recognize a few points that you know uh, sitting in, in private equity you know you really get the advantage of both being you know being able to use your hands and, and your brain as a, as an operator and investor one of the things that's great is you know in venture capital you're you're really able to provide you know hopefully a lot of value to early stage efforts of product and company building it as a seed stage investor but you're very much sitting on the sidelines for most of it and you're just really um, doing a lot of that selection and diligence upfront before you decide to make that investor and then just being helpful to the founding team whatever way is possible now with private equity you're obviously coming in with a, a control position you're typically owning a you know, minimum 51 percent of, of an organization when you when you agree to partner and, and um, you know make an investment or, or a full acquisition and then you're really calling the shots from there you know you basically said hey this organization has been able to grow you know up to this point in scale Maybe the founders want out. Maybe they need some additional type of help. You know, they're really engineering focused and, and need some support on go to market, for example. And so we kind of took a, took a look at that uh, from the perspective of like, well, uh, you know, private equity can be a great craft from both the seller and the buyer's perspective. You know, from the seller's perspective, typically, especially in kind of lower mid market private equity, they just generally haven't been, sorry, let me, I guess, Give a bit of context around that. Lower mid market in our world is like we think about companies that are doing less than ten million dollars of ARR and, and less than five million of, of EBITDA. And typically, there haven't been many uh, liquidity opportunities for them. You know, there aren't these large private equity firms don't don't necessarily look to buy them because they're just too small unless they're being added on or bolted on to one of their existing uh, products in the portfolio. And so we thought, well, look, if there's a, a way that we can kind of come in and provide a, a private equity model, particularly to software businesses doing less than $10 million of, of, of annual recurring revenue. You know, this, this provides liquidity events uh, and helps de-risk the founder journey, which is great from the seller's perspective and providing a, a vehicle that they you know, really hasn't been uh, involved in, in the marketplace for the last you know, couple of decades. But also on the, on the buyer's perspective, you know, whether you're a value or a momentum in, investor, um, you know, you, instead of kind of coming back and saying, I'm going to start the business all over again, you really get to come in at kind of like the second step in a business and really help them propel through kind of act two of the business. And so we, we kind of had a, our team internally, we had a bet that, that SaaS is still, you know, really in its, its first innings. And we're, you know, very long on that business model, um, you know, irrespective of some, some frothy valuations in market today. Uh, and so we, we kind of took a bet there that we, we'd say, look, we're going to build out, um, you know, a strategy, which is a, an investment firm that takes, uh, not only minority investments in in SaaS companies that we think are doing amazing things in in the areas of health tech and fintech and work tech, which in other words is saying a, a kind of early stage uh, venture capital firm, which is minority investing. We also have a, another strategy, which is to do complete buyouts, and that's anywhere from you know fifty one to one hundred percent control ownerships, where we then come in and, and really uh, roll up our sleeves and, and get really operationally involved in helping to continue growing and leading those businesses. And we'll, we'll typically look to hold those you know a lot of other firms have a different strategy where they're kind of permanent capital or hold codes where they say we acquire and never have the intention to sell um we have a different strategy which is to say hey we're, we're going to be a great acquirer for a certain part of that journey and if the company's doing between one to ten million dollars of annual recurring revenue we look to acquire it and, and somewhere within that kind of three to six year period we can hope to double revenue and then pass it off to another uh, owner which is potentially better suited at that point in time that's really the, the foundation of, of Bloom. We launched that uh, that fund into market, Bloom Venture Partners last year, and the team's now at about six and looking to probably double again this year on the investment side. We've just uh, done about 13 investments on the VC fund in uh, in 2020 and uh, yeah, just, just completed our first acquisition, looking to do probably about three to five more acquisitions in, in this year alone. So you, you picked up on a couple of points there, which are really interesting. Um, we'll come back to the SaaS point in a second, but just to clarify, am I, am I getting this right in the sense that the structure of, of Bloom really is, you mentioned it as being threefold. So it's essentially the, the private equity part of the business. And then you've got a separate but connected part, which is around your investments uh, on the minority stake side. And then you've kind of got your what you call studio, which I also want to want to deep dive into, which is essentially helping businesses, but not necessarily taking the same positions you do in those other areas. So I guess the question is, can you just explain a bit more about those three verticals and then also how they interact and what value that gives you because they can interact? Yeah, great, great question. So you, you're spot on. There's effectively three legs to the stool at, at Bloom as an investment firm. And we think it's kind of quite unique to our knowledge. There's no, no one else out there uh, with this similar model right now. 
at least buying and acquiring companies in, in our segment of SaaS and doing it at the, the scale of businesses. Um, certainly there's kind of one person or ind- individual operators that kind of have the same model, but, but kind of focused on, you know, 100K revenue businesses as opposed to five to $10 million revenue uh, software businesses. So there's, there's, there's three, effectively three concepts. One is called Studio, which is where we provide like hands-on operational support either around uh, product design and development and then go to market. And kind of the two the two big big boulders there and uh you know we work with a lot of consulting teams that we can we can fly in to either help our internal portfolio companies whether they're in a, a minority like vc investment or they're some of the uh, the actual uh companies that we've made a, a full acquisition of and they effectively serve as a, as a shared services re- repo um and so that that's been growing uh, very well we've also had uh interestingly interest from a lot of uh, external mature clients uh, or, or kind of brands in, in the marketplace that are saying like, hey, you know, we're, we're a SaaS company and, and we just need generalist help, particularly around go to market, uh, which is where we thought was was pretty interesting. You know, originally the intent was that our, uh, our studio model would, wouldn't be to incubate ideas. Um, you know, obviously there's kind of venture labs and others that, that do that. This was a case of saying like, hey, once we've either invested into a company as a minority or we've done a full acquisition, we'd then put our consulting team on to help. But um yeah, interestingly, we've got we have had a lot of interest from some mature brands in uh, who are particularly software as service businesses that have said, "Hey, we actually really need some consulting support to, um, you know, spin up a new instance of a CRM or a marketing automation tool and to help with setting up our uh, outbound sales team." And uh, you know, it wasn't really a, ca- a capability or the intended capability of uh, of that that solution. But non- nonetheless, uh, you know, obviously there's there's an immediate value add and, and crossover, and obviously one of the key differentiators that a lot of uh, founders love when we are speaking to them to either make a minority investment or to do a full acquisition and, and help them um, after we've acquired their company. You know, they, they often, you know, founders often come to us and say, hey, we're, we're really strong on this capability set. Like we've got amazing technical founders, but we're actually a little bit underweight and, and light on with marketing or with branding or with ABC. And so we like to say like that's, a, that's an area of value add that we can uh, kind of parachute in some expertise there and help. So that's kind of the crossover point of studio onto the VC and PE. Um, on the VC, um, yeah, that, that's really exciting. You know, one of the things that, you know, obviously I haven't come from a traditional uh, as a, you know, investment professional on the finance side of the house, more so on the operating sort of sitting inside businesses as a, um, you know, technically a full-time CEO now uh, and helping to run the, these, these organizations. And, um, you know, that's really something that we're, we're really proud of is that a lot of the uh, investors into our fund are actually operators themselves. You know, these, are, these are folks you know, typically across uh, America, UK, Australia, um, who are, uh, come with a lot of operating background of kind of series seed all the way through to series E or even a few publicly listed, uh, company CEOs who are, who are investors in that fund. And, uh, yeah, we're obviously continuing to scale that up. We're probably looking to do around like one to two investments uh, per month now go- going forward and, uh, have welcomed on some amazing new partners, particularly some family offices. And then the third pillar, which I, which I mentioned, which is really where I guess a lot of the focus on Bloom Venture Partners going forward will be around is uh, is obviously coming in and, and making these acquisitions of these SaaS firms between one to ten million dollars. And uh, in for us, you know, where it's really concentrated, B two B SaaS is the same. You know, finding either really horizontal or really vertical platforms. You know, the more boring, the better. Ideally, you, you've never you've never heard of these companies, and, and we can come in and uh, we can just really partner up with, with teams and founders can either you know stay or, or transition out where we're completely flexible there and uh you know i think that's something that you know if i was to kind of make a bet i think there's going to be more and more um you know acquirers coming into that one to ten million dollar arl space uh, over the next few years which historically has just seen a, a you know massive oversupply of sellers that haven't been able to match up with it with a buyer um, and typically because they're either you know buyers are either uh, individuals who obviously can't afford to independently buy you know, a $3 million revenue business at, at 5X, that's $15 million. That's a, that's a lot of cash for one person. Or they're private equity firms who are moving more and more up market, right? So they've, you know, they've raised $50 million of capital, but combined with, you know, the debt that you can put onto these businesses and other financial, um, you know, engineering, you know, they're, they're kind of moving more and more up to saying, we're going to try and find, you know, 20 to $30 million revenue businesses. So there's been this kind of massive, uh, you know, over, overlooking of uh, that one to $10 million ARL space. And that's really where we're, we're double clicking on. So, but um, SaaS is probably one of my favorite niches or niche as my American friends say. And what- so you, how, do you, what how do you Australians <laughs> say it? I, I call it niche as, as well. Niche. You know, okay, there, there, you, there, you, there you go. The proper way. 
my work, my American vocabulary down between data and data is a, is a good one, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I'm trying to get at is, uh, and I, when, I, when I worked in tech banking, we actually financed uh, a fair amount of LBOs for SaaS companies, but that was mid-market and you see it a lot at the corporate stage, at the mid-market stage. Where you guys are, which is lower mid-market, as you said earlier, how it's very unique because as you said, I currently, I'm not aware of many players in the market and you probably are. I'm not, I do anticipate that it will be flooded with a lot of players in the next decade. Um, how are your deals structured generally? If you can maybe touch on it high level, are they a mix of, let's say equity debt cash? Um, and yeah. And also, you know, once, once you talk about structuring the deal, what else do you look for other than, you know, visibility of revenues? You know, I love nothing more than a, sticky customer base, mission critical, minimum 12 month visibility of revenues, low churn. Um, Iman knows that this stuff like gets me excited more than anything else. Yeah, it, it turns them <laughs> on. <laughs> so um, yeah, like how do you structure your deals and what else do you look for in these deals? Yeah, great, great question. So on the, on the first point in, uh, in, in structuring, so let me, let me take a step back and just kind of give you an overview of like the two distinct strategies that we, we actually have. Um, in terms of the targets that we go out and and, uh, and and we get really excited to be able to partner with on the buyout fund, so target number one is uh, is, is really what we kind of call like third quartile VC or kind of like fallen angels. So you know, it's basically companies that have gone out, they've raised outside capital, uh, typically they've gone into like institutional VCs, um, and their modus operandi is grow, 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 right? You know, being here in America, you know, I kind of walk past a lot of these companies every day in San Francisco. They've raised a huge amount of cash, you know, 20, 30 million dollars, revenues at a million dollars that they're trying to catch up. And, um, and maybe it's not even 20 or 30 million dollars. Maybe it's, they've raised, you know, a large seed round and it's a four million dollar round. They're growing at 800, 900, a million dollars of revenue, but, you know, they start plateauing growth and, but they're still like, they've got a 30, 20, 30 person team. Basically, the story I'm trying to paint here is that a lot of these businesses is like they become upside down for, you know, escape velocity type businesses. And very quickly, what happens is their growth rate plateaus or it's just it's not as steep enough in order to uh, complete follow on growth equity rounds of financing. Right. And so this company we can't make the jump from a series C to an A an A to a B. Typically, that's kind of the point because if you get to Series C, the companies are too large. They're probably doing more, more than $10 million of revenue already. And so within that category, and what typically happens is that these, these companies go out and they have to raise external forms of financing, right? Like maybe they do a down round of financing. Maybe they take some you know, money from, um, you know, they've raised, previously raised from T1 VC. They're taking money from kind of, you know, family offices that they've never met. It's just like really short term, like crutch capital to get them out of a bind. Um, lo, lo and behold, is like they, they start falling into like the third quartile of a, of a firm. And, and so, you know, typically they start having a lot of these uncomfortable truth conversations around the boardroom table and say, you know what, maybe this business, like it actually does make sense. We kind of, we had an assumption when we, when we you know, put a lot of capital into this business out of the gate when product was really early, we didn't have much you know, make data points in the market. Maybe this business is actually getting better off finding a home within a private equity buyer where, to a private equity buyer, let's say 20, 30, 40% growth a year is actually a great outcome. But to a VC that's looking for like, I think they call them like thunder lizards or like getting like escape velocity, right? Where it's like, hey, we're going to make a $3 million investment in a company at a 10 million valuation. And we hope that we can truly get, you know, it's the one company that returns the entire portfolio, right? It's the Slack, it's the Affirm, it's, it's one of those platforms. Um, and so that they're kind of a company that we, we would look to uh, pick up and, you know, again, under that category, typically those companies aren't running pro uh, profitably, right? By, by virtue of being VC back, you know, typically the majority of those companies, their profile is, hey, we're just spending big. We've got large, you know, nice offices pre, pre COVID and we've got nice offices, you know, we're, we're just like really aggressively spending on marketing channels, um, because we're funded by VC capital. Um, and so with that, the structure is going to be a little different. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the structure uh, in, a, in a second, but the structure on those types of businesses is going to be very different to a second category, which kind of look at it as like these Berkshire businesses. And, and typically these are bootstrap companies that haven't raised any outside financing and their founders have been doing doing their things, just building these businesses where they either haven't had the interest or haven't been able to raise outside capital. And again, typically you kind of find it, we see very commonly you know, these founders that 
Uh, they start these businesses because they've got a lot of engineering experience. They build, 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 build. Customers come in at the renewal point and say, hey, you've, de- you've delivered these eight features in the last year. That's great. In order to renew, I want these next six features. They keep building this amazing piece of technology. All their investments going into R&D, but because they don't have a lot of experience necessarily in uh, in, in kind of distribution, um, they're, they're, they're really underweight. So you look at these businesses and it's either like the founders don't want to or like aren't able to like really accelerate their businesses beyond like low seven figures of, of revenue. And so these founders will say like, hey, I either just like, I want some liquidity. I've been in this business for five, six years. I want to go to my next project or, you know, I want a growth partner to come in and really help turbocharge. I just don't know how to do it. I know it's important and I know we need to fund it. I just don't know how to run marketing and distribution. And so they're the two businesses in, in that, those categories, either like kind of fallen angels or third quartile VC businesses that are being divested out of a fund. And then secondly, these kind of uh, bootstrapped uh, uh, SaaS platforms. So within that, when, when it comes to structuring, obviously those two different businesses are going to be very different. One's going to be growing a lot faster in terms of just revenue line, a, a slope of growth, which is obviously the VC back businesses versus potentially the, the bootstrap companies. Um, and so that very much influences the structure that we put on because if it is uh, you know, a business that let's say the bootstrap company, it's got, you know, three to five years of operating history. It's had, you know, really sticky customers, as, as you were saying, Cyrus, really sticky customers, you know, good net dollar retention, you know, customers are hanging around for a couple of years. And it's not like incredible churn. Then you can go to a lender and say, look, here's the beauty of SaaS. These business models are so predictable that, you know, we, we have a really high likelihood or a really low, like, you know, high, high margin of safety and a low level of risk that we're going to be able to not be able to service the debt or the loan to these businesses. And so, um, you know, what's really amazing is when you actually start moving up into these like two, three, four million dollar revenue businesses that do have that profile. There are a lot of lenders out there that are, that are very excited to lend against those businesses and, and do so at you know, relatively affordable rates where you're not putting crazy warrants and, and, and all sorts of, uh, un- ungodly. Uh, interest rates on on the repayments. Um, so we, we bottom line, we, we kind of look to, it really depends if it's, you know, running really uh, aggressively on revenue and there's no profit, obviously you can't really lend against it. Um, and so we would then come in and say, look, we kind of put uh, a valuation based on revenue multiple and there might be a cash component up front with some sort of like earn out or a hold back. Again, it's really, we try to co-author a lot of these with, um, with every founder because just like when you're hiring an employee right and one employee is like i would rather the lowest possible base and put everything into stock options at the company and then the second employee behind them is like i don't even understand how equity works and i don't have the ability like my my home loan is so expensive right now i need all liquidity right now and it's not saying that i don't believe in the company it's just i just need maximum amount of salary right now well, it's, it's the same when you're acquiring a company, right? No, no two founders are going to be the same in terms of preference, whether they want to stay or go, what role they take on, you know, uh, in particular, like how these deals are structured. Maybe they say, I want the least amount of cash out now and I want the max amount of equity so that, you know, when you come in in the next three to five years and we double revenue, well, then I can get you know, a second bite at the apple yeah, over, over the up and get some more upside as well. And so we, we kind of look to be pretty flexible working with founders on, on the structuring piece. Um, I'll pause there just to see if there's any questions and then otherwise we can go on to, um, you know, look at, I guess, how we actually analyze some of these SaaS businesses, if, if that's helpful. I don't have any questions, but I just want to double click on something you mentioned, which was what you look for in founders. So if, if you do go through the next part of the question, I just, I just want to understand how that then links into what you actually look for in founders as well, because you've talked about structuring and what founders typically might want, but it'd be interesting to understand what you, what you want from the founders as well as you answer it? Yeah, great, great question. So I'll kind of give, give an example. Um, I won't be able to share the name yet just because it's it's not fully public yet, but uh, you know, here's an example of a, a client we've been, uh, or a target in the industry that we've been, we've been speaking with. Um, they, uh, you know, this, this business has been sitting inside of a, a VC firm for, for many years, really horizontal platform. And uh, you know, a lot of money has been in, invested into, uh, uh, going into R and D and building out like truly a world class platform. Um, but you know, there's a, and these things happen quite, quite commonly. There just been, um, some things that happened within the organization, um, that, you know, there'd been a few key team members that, um, you know, hadn't stayed on board over the last few years. And as a result, growth, um, of kind of new revenue growth in the business had really deteriorated and, and suffered. And so we were introduced to the, to the business and said, wow, 
there's a there's a ton of profit uh, already coming out of this business um and you know it just so turned out that the current owner uh which is a or majority owner which is a vc firm they they kind of had acknowledged that they perhaps weren't the most suitable hands-on investor to help the company go through its next period of growth and also as we kind of took a step back and diligence the broader market the actual you know the, the, the market the industry that this business or the product was in we just saw tremendous tailwinds where we said look you don't even need to be this is definitely not a winner take all market this is a, a highly fragmented market where you can take a very horizontal solution and, and really convert it into a more niche solution and verticalize it over time and you know maybe it's this product today has got you know it's really the swiss army knife you can do 27 different things but let's just nail the niche and let's just boil it down to three things that it does really well in fact better than anyone else out there in the market uh, globally today and then pick them and just double down and just all the all the positioning all the outbound communication everything is just like really tailored around these like two or three specific markets and we effectively forfeit and and concede these other segments where we're just not really winning and you know we're bidding against really uh, you know bidding in uh, in kind of search engine marketing and, and losing out against other teams that have got you know uh, 20 50 times the headcount and uh, and revenue size and so when we when we looked at that business we said well great uh you know you, you kind of look at some of the metrics here like this it, it just turns out this is an incredibly sticky sticky, sticky product right the average customer has been been staying around north of five years um you know keeps upselling it's uh it's mission critical software and you actually look at the product it is truly being used every single day which we say is you know a, a must-have not a nice to have or a, a painkiller not a not a vitamin water you know th this isn't uh you know kind of selling to prosumers where you've got twenty thousand or sixty thousand customers that are all monthly and just huge churn issues in the business it's quite the other way around it's basically saying this is a, a must-have product uh it's been amazing must-have product with a, a lot of investment gone into um into the development of it They've just been spread way too thin in terms of which markets they really go after. And the existing base of revenue just continues growing along nicely. They just haven't been able to really hit an inflection point and really re-accelerate growth after um, you know, a couple of team changes that, that happened in, internally. And so we say, great, that's an amazing opportunity for our team, given our operating experience, to be able to come in, partner really closely with the existing management team and, and leadership and say, hey, we think we have not only the, the strategy here, but then we could actually roll up our sleeves and truly get hands on in the weeds with you. And um, you know, if we need, you know, to roll out a three quarter, uh, you know, program around SEO, SEM, referral marketing, like we know exactly the consultants because we actually had them in house because it's part of our studio program. So rumor has it, a lot of people say that uh, there's been a SaaS bull market for 11 years now, uh, given all the rocket ships we've seen. Many failures, of course, but we've seen a lot of rocket ships. And some say that these valuations for these rocket ships are within SaaS and not so much justified. Um, what's your view? Do you, do you think that you know SaaS revenue growth is going to slow down now at when not maybe not so much at, let's say, a lower market or mid market, but once they gain some traction, let's say like your Slacks and Zooms and your larger uh, SaaS companies. Do you think these valuations are justified and what's your sort of prediction for the decade ahead? Um, and what, what sort of verticals within SaaS are you most bullish on? Yeah, great, great question. So we, we, we do spend a, a lot of time thinking about that. Um, obviously there's, you know, two different fields or, or sort of you know, movements, whether you're more of a value investor where you like to try to stay very disciplined or you're, you know, uh, a, a, another more, you know, growth oriented, um, momentum investor where it's like, Hey, we, we're just going to ride this out and, uh, you know, going to pay up handsomely for aggressive growth that's in the business and, and, and back our way into it. I think answering that question, it can't be done in, in isolation of what's happening in the broader market right now, which you mentioned, Cyrus, we are in a, in an extended bull market. I think a lot of people were. Um, you know, I've, I've certainly spoken with a, a lot of mentors and uh, investment professionals that have got, you know, three, four decades on me that, that have said, have said, look, we kind of actually hope that there was probably a, an additional 10 to 25% clearance in the market last year. And because that didn't get flushed out, I mean, even what like, we're sitting right now recording on the 13th of January and just in the last few weeks with what's happened with crypto and, and uh, certainly Tesla and a lot of other run-ups pretty quickly. Um, you know, there's obviously a, a growing level of concern of what's actually going to happen. Like, are we at the peak yet? Is it three weeks, three months, three years, six years? 
uh, I think you know history would tell us that we're we're probably due for that correction. Uh, that's going to be pretty painful, um, pretty pretty shortly. So I think like I want to acknowledge that as like a backdrop, which I think there's you know depending on which way you look at it, we're either underpriced or overpriced where the market is right now. My my view is just I think there's a lot of uh, hysteria uh, and speculative investments uh, or speculative pricing into positions right now. Um, and that's kind of across many different asset classes, real estate, stocks, et cetera. So, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of think, and, and, you know, like the fact that real, real rate of return of bonds and, and other uh, securities is just kind of you're effectively taking out uh, inflation, you're in negative territory. So I think people are just kind of clamoring, looking for it. And obviously, as, I, as you said, zeroing in on tech, there's obviously just been um, a huge lift in, in recent years. Now, the second part of your question is like, what do I, and that, that's kind of my, how do we get here and what's happened? Now, switching it to what do I think is going to happen going forward? Obviously, I've got the same crystal ball that everyone else does. Um, you know, I guess my, my thinking here is that there's, um, if, you, if you isolate, take away the valuations, if you just look at what's happening at SaaS, well, you know, SaaS as a business model, maybe it's the, the Benioff of the world that have kind of been the benefactor of like um, seeding SaaS uh, as, as a business model here. But, um, you know, I think particularly as we go up into governments, into large enterprise, um, you know, the, con- the consumerization of SaaS, people are just more and more familiar now, um, you know, from a security perspective, from understanding the pricing models, um, that they're, you know, they're moving away from on-prem and they're, they're moving to these SaaS companies. They're moving to these earlier stage startups and they're, they're willing to take in a, you know, a, a bet on a, you know, a 20 person team in, in Silicon Valley that they'd, they'd never heard of versus a, an Oracle or, or an IBM. Um, and as these companies start growing faster and faster because, you know, they're, they're saying, Hey, you know, we can deploy products faster. It's never been easier to build SaaS applications. Companies now recognize that they get value based on growth. Right. And so they're saying, well, if we can actually grow faster and faster and the markets reward us for rate of growth, yes, for profitability, but way more so for top line growth, um, then, then that's great. Let's double down on that. So I think there's been this kind of con- confluence where, you know, you've said before that valuations are getting it's kind of skyrocketing or eye watering. And I think that's a, it's a reaction to um, investors really paying forward to say, well, if you look at kind of revenues as a multiple of, of EV, like these companies are just growing faster today than they ever have before. And so they're willing to pay up saying, you know, if we're, we're looking at Shopify or what, what we just didn't think of in terms of enterprise values, you know, five years ago, these companies are just smashing past them in terms of how much market share they can grow. And so I think investors are kind of learning from what's happening over the last five years, recognizing that, you know, what was previously billion dollar TAMs are now growing into trillion dollar TAMs. And, uh, you know, if you kind of run that model forward for the next five to 10 years, irrespective of any short term correction that, you know, there's a lot of investors that want to get access to, um, these re- recurring, repeatable, highly predictable revenue models. What would be your advice then if someone wants to build a, a SaaS company and they want to get the attention of someone like yourself? How, what, what are the first steps or what, what, what do they need to do in order to, to essentially build a business in the first instance, but then raise capital in the context of this market? As, as you say, we could have a crash tomorrow. We could have it in six years. So, what are some things they can do to ensure that they're more hedged against that risk? Great, great question. Um, I've spent a lot of time actually talked a bit about this on, on Twitter over the last few weeks as, as well. Um, because, you know, I think there's obviously been a surge of uh, amazing founders coming out and, you know, kind of you think about uh, Mark Andreessen's kind of call to action of like, let's, let's build. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's been really exciting to see uh, a lot of founders go out and building. And as I said a moment ago, it's never been easier. Technologically speaking, it's never been easier, right? If you think I always like get fascinated when you go and, and listen to, to stories of, you know, folks that were building back in the like software businesses back in the nineties or in the early thousands. And they were like, well, we went out and raised a couple of million dollars and half a million dollars went to put a server up. And you're like, wait, what? Like, uh, you know, a couple of clicks and AWS is hosting your application for you. Like, that's just, just kind of crazy. The amount of time and uh, capital intensive uh, dollars and, and fiscally and any resource or headcount to manage that. You know, today it's just clicks of a button. You know, you, you, it's, it's so easy. And so um, I, I kind of worry when I see, you know, the sixth app doing ABC, you know, for uh, remote fitness or remote work or what have you. I kind of look at it as like, hey, 
you know, have you really thought this through in terms of, you know, they're building a software business. Not every founder starts with the same goal. Some are saying, Hey, I just want to bootstrap this, you know, getting $250,000 a year of paying myself like an income. That's, that's amazing. That's a dream come true. And you can do that without any capital. There are others that are saying, Hey, you know, in order for me to win the market, speed is key. And, uh, you know, just given the market size as well, and the amount of product that you need to build, not just features or a product, but an actual platform and an ecosystem. It's just really capital intensive. I love a Stripe or, or an Affirm and a Slack. And so you need to raise capital to build the product really quickly and win the market quickly. So we kind of, when, we, when we're doing early stage investing, we, we like to think a lot around like the team, the product, the terms of the deal, the, the traction, and obviously just having a, a, having a, a bet on, on the market and what's that kind of key inflection point or, or catalyst of, of change. But I guess one of the things that I'd always, always counsel founders around is like not needing uh, outside capital as a crutch. I mean, the common one here, and we kind of talk about this internally, is that we heard a few founders that are saying like, hey, we're raising capital now to pay ourselves salary. And we kind of say, well, hey, maybe the, the conversation is like raise, raise growth capital when you found a repeatable way to acquire customers uh, cost efficiently. And then that's why you're reaching out to growth investors to say, hey, a dollar of capital in now can actually come back at, you know, $6.80 of, of profit down the line, which we're going to reinvest straight in and just keep that flywheel spinning and it's growing. Um, I think that's probably the big, the biggest thing that I'd always counsel uh, founders, uh, I guess, coming, coming back to your point, Iman, is especially given the economic uncertainty or cloud of uncertainty right now, if you never, if you're in a position of never needing outside capital as a crutch, then uh, that's the greatest way to kind of keep control of your own destiny, which let's face it, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why every founder starts off down that that path. Yeah, awesome. So just before we start to wrap up, but you guys had a great 2020, you launched in 2020 and you, you've you achieved a great deal in a short amount of time. What are your plans for the few years ahead? What does the future hold for Bloom? Yeah, great, great question. I mean, look, for, for us, we're, you know, but by, by now, uh, pretty, pretty obvious. We're, we're B2B SaaS in investors. We, we love B2B SaaS. Um, I think we're going to continue, um, you know, raising more and more capital to get out there and, and really support early stage investors, uh, in both product and company building as, as kind of a VC arm. And then, uh, you know, particularly on that, on that buyout side, you know, I guess our, our goal internally and our, our mission is really become one of those mainstream, uh, mainstay firms where, Founders building, you know, doing between one to ten million dollars revenue as a B two B SaaS company, uh, you know, for whatever the reason or the catalyst, they can say, hey, you know, Bloom Bloom is a great partner. It's either you know an off ramp for me to kind of go go on and and, and cash out, um, you know, take some risk off the table and some chips off the table and go to my next thing, or to stay on board but to bring in you know a really operationally and and, and growth focused uh, investment uh, investment firm. So. Yeah, obviously really excited to continue kind of building out our, our name and obviously, uh, you know, our NPS through founder referrals in, in the in the ecosystem, which is how we do most of our uh, investing uh, and acquisitions to date. Let me take the discussion a little bit away from, from venture, from financing, from founders, all of that good stuff, and just learn a little bit more about you, if that's okay. Um, we like to ask this question of everyone, but if you could name your three favorite books, it doesn't have to be in any order, but what, if, what books that have shaped your worldview as a founder, as an investor and, um, uh, and have helped you in life generally as well. Yeah. I see a couple of, uh, great ones behind you. So yeah, it's, uh, still, still building out the, the collection. Well, I've actually, I've and a bit of a tangential point, but, uh, still I've actually spent more time now going deep on my Kindle, which I, uh, kind of find embeds better in my work workflow. I kind of, highlight and take notes and then sync that straight across into my notion. So um, I don't know if you get more tech than that, but uh, yeah, so I've kind of stopped with a lot of the, the hard, hard cover <laughs> re- releases, but yeah, look, be, obviously uh, I, I kind of think about it now and, and kind of it's taking a step back. I used to put a lot of pressure on myself to kind of read and think that was like the best outlet of, of learning and of kind of, you know, very much first principles, which principles by Ray Dalio is probably one of my, one of my top three. Um, but as a first principle, I've kind of reorchestrated the goal, which is the goal is learning and learning can come through many mediums, whether it's hopping on 20 minute zoom calls with just amazing people, uh, you know, during COVID in particular podcasts is actually where I spend a lot of time now. Um, just being really concise, filtered content, typically listen to them on like one and a half or two X speed and then quickly take down notes while I'm uh, on a walk. Uh, I find that really, really amazing. So, Probably spend more time like 
learning and through podcasts and uh, and through newsletters, uh, particularly like Substack uh, newsletters nowadays. But in terms of books, um, obviously a huge non nonfiction uh, person, I'd say some of the books that shaped me, like Ray, Ray Dalio Principles. I think that was a uh, you know a seminal piece. Like I kind of go back, probably reread that like three times now, um, and. Um, and that thing that's just like generally applicable to a lot of things in life, which is why I kind of find that one of my, one of my, my go-tos over the end of year holiday reflections. Um, obviously just given vocationally where I'm spending a, a lot of time now thinking as a, as an investor and an operator in the world of private equity, it's, um, uh, you know, Blackstone's obviously one of the, the biggest funds out there and, and Stephen Schwartzman, the founder and CEO, uh, his, his book, what it takes, uh, it was, it was amazing. I read that a couple of years ago, uh, while I was on a ski trip in, in Japan and, uh, often refer back to that. I think that was really one of the, the catalysts of me um, stepping out of the, the private equity firm that I was working for at that point in time to uh, to launching um, our own firm here at Bloom. And then a book that I picked up recently, I acknowledge I'm only a couple of chapters in, but so far it's, um, it's been pretty amazing, is the, the psychology of money. You know, my, my Morgan House or anything it is perhaps. Um, yeah, Morgan House. Yeah, that's been very, very interesting and thinking a lot around Kind of the difference between you know well, uh, income versus wealth, and, and kind of you know like the in- invisibility of wealth as a mechanism to buy uh, buy freedom, which uh, I think dovetails a lot into what Naval talks a lot about. And I've spent a bunch of time, just as I'm sure many of your listeners have, just kind of thinking through Naval's thoughts on on wealth as well. Um, so that's been that's been really interesting uh, as well. Those, those three books. I really liked that one of your tweets recently was about uh, you quoted Naval. And you said, uh, you refer to when Naval talks about you live life in sprints, rest, sprints, rest periods, rather than you're always being on. And this is something you're sort of going to take up more this year. And uh, I think that's paramount to success. It's one of the foundational uh, keys in my view as well. So I agree with that tweet of yours. And uh, what more rational than uh, quoting either Naval or Morgan Housel. So yeah, there you have it. Awesome. So, uh, where can founders pitch you, reach you, and just generally anyone, even if they're not a founder, if they want to just follow you, where can they find you? Yep. Uh, in- increasingly, I'm just spending most of my day on, on Twitter now. Uh, so, at Bart McDonald. Um, I, uh, yeah, always love having other founders jump into, into the DM and just have a, a great conversation. Um, yeah, obviously, just try to be as helpful as I can, but I try and move actually most of my conversations back across to my main feed and just kind of try to build it, build in public, which is um, obviously a little bit harder to do when you're on the investment side. But I think there's just a lot of mystique, particularly around private equity. Obviously, there it's quite opaque. Um, I'm sorry, quite quite transparent rather in um, in in the world of VC. Um, but I think certainly in, in private equity, like there's still a bit of like mystique around like how decisions are made, how private equity firms work, how the structuring work. Um, and as I said before, uh, to, to your point, Iman, I think. You know, I, I just think that there's going to be an explosion of other uh, firms or at least buyers of different profiles, whether they're individuals or consortium of individuals or they're actual private equity firms who are, have raised external money from LPs that are focusing on this like lower mid-market SaaS space. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, I can't stop that. I kind of rewire it first principles and say, well, how do I just be, um, you know, an, an, an early believer and, and a champion of the community and, um, you know, hopefully by virtue of that, more and more deals come our way in, in time and, um, you know, try to be kind of building out Bloom as a private equity and VC fund in, in public. Yeah, awesome. But it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thanks for taking the time. I have zero doubt that you guys are going to, you know, uh, reach the highest of highs. Uh, you're going to be a rocket ship yourselves within Bloom. And uh, yeah, we'll have you back on again in the future. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Bob. This has been awesome. Thanks so much, Cyrus. Come on.